Ever since the global economic crisis erupted a decade ago, austerity has been on trial. Fiscal conservatives say that huge debt overhangs make retrenchment unavoidable. If creditors lose confidence, they'll stop lending, investment will plummet, and potential and actual growth will suffer. But a growing number of voices argue that, by depressing demand, austerity often does more harm than good. We're trying to fight the conservative policy. They need to know that we are not uh, happy with what they're doing with us. The harm is certainly more widespread because the poor and middle class inevitably bear the brunt of cuts in government benefits and public services. And the pain is aggravated when austerity includes tax hikes, intended to enable the government to repay creditors even faster. But the austerity debate long predates the 2008 crisis. Austerity is closely associated with the neoliberal doctrine advocated in the 1970s and 1980s by the likes of Milton Friedman and Margaret Thatcher, and embraced in the 1990s by major center-left parties when it became known as the Washington Consensus. The first pillar of that consensus is increased economic competition, achieved through deregulation, market opening, and free trade. The second is a reduced role for the state, achieved through privatization and limits on the ability of governments to run fiscal deficits and accumulate debt. Lower deficits and reduced debt may help to promote long-term economic health. Keynesians favor fiscal retrenchment in good times to create room for higher public spending in bad times. But some neoliberal austerity advocates treat lower debts and deficits as ends in themselves. They regard any public spending as inherently suspect and treat profligate governments as somehow immoral. In fact, neoliberal economists have sought to prove that government spending is either destructive or futile. The Barrow Ricardo equivalents, for example, insist that when a government tries to stimulate an economy by increasing debt finance spending, demand remains unchanged because the public increases their savings to pay for expected future tax increases. But the reality is not so simple. For one thing, people can't always choose when they borrow and save. And in the U.S., for example, the personal saving rate has fallen to multi-decade lows, even as government borrowing has soared. The International Monetary Fund has long backed austerity, including recently in Jordan. But even it is now taking a more nuanced view. In 2016, the IMF released a report arguing that austerity is not always the right choice. By reducing aggregate demand, increasing unemployment, and exacerbating inequality, austerity can significantly lower both the rate and sustainability of growth, particularly when implemented in hard times, as in countries like Greece and Spain. The costs, the IMF now says, might even be high enough to make fiscal consolidation a bad bet in good times for countries with lots of fiscal space, like the UK and the US. Portugal, one of Europe's hardest hit countries during the Euro crisis, exemplifies austerity's limits. After its government was forced to implement stringent austerity measures in exchange for a bailout, unemployment surged and poverty increased. In 2015, however, the government reversed course. Within two years, investment had risen, unemployment had plummeted, and growth had stabilized, bringing the deficit down by more than half. Of course, austerity was not the only issue in Portugal, which still faces its fair share of challenges. But the contrast could not be sharper between Portugal's fate and that of countries like Greece and Italy in the last decade, or of Asian economies that followed the IMF's austerity recipe in the 1990s. And today, the rising China's statist approach, for good or bad, has emerged as a compelling model for countries seeking an alternative to the neoliberal formula.